So somebody has started making a Bridgerton musical on TikTok. The other issue, and I hate to keep coming back to this point, these TikTokers do not actually own the rights to Bridgerton. I'm not convinced it's actually going to happen. Perhaps I'm wrong. There is nothing on earth that we share. It is Netflix or Barlow and Bear. Eh? Oh my god, hey! Welcome back to my Stagey YouTube channel. If you are meeting me for the first time, hello! My name is Mickey Joe, and I am obsessed with all things theatre. I'm also an independent theatre critic and a content creator based here in the UK, and I tend to review shows that I'm invited to go and see in London and in the UK on this side of the Atlantic, but I do also like to weigh in and talk about drama and news and gossip that is happening on Broadway in America on the other side of the Atlantic. And today that is exactly what we are going to be doing, because while I was in Croatia having a holiday, I woke up to the news that Netflix was suing Abigail Barlow and Emily Bear, creators of the unofficial Bridgerton musical. The same musical which recently won a Grammy Award for Best Musical Album. Album. It was recently performed by a bunch of Broadway stars alongside the show's composers at the Kennedy Center in the US, very prestigious venue, and is due to be performed at the Royal Albert Hall, an equally prestigious theatre over here in the UK. However, this may have thrown a very fancy Regency spanner into the works. This story has absolutely blown up online. It has become this huge, huge thing. We're going to go right back to the beginning, and I'm going to explain to you how we got to this point. Now, the knee-jerk reaction to this from a lot of fans has been, how dare you, Netflix? Why would you not partner with these girls? Why would you not endorse this show, help bring it to the stage? It's mutually beneficial. It's helping bring exposure for the TV show. Why are you not helping this become a bigger thing? And a lot of people are quick to judge Netflix as kind of the big Goliath business entity in this situation dunking on the small guy. And they see Abigail Barlow and Emily Bear as the underdogs in this situation. However, the more you read up on this case and everything that has since emerged about it, that perception may be about to shift. So if that is how you are currently feeling about this situation, I defy you to watch until the end of this video and see if you still feel that way. Also, if you do enjoy today's video, feel free to give me a super thanks down below and make sure you're subscribed to my channel. I talk about stuff like this all the time and everything going on in the theater world in the UK and in the US. So let's discuss. So if we go back to the beginning, the Bridgerton books were a series by Julia Quinn that were adapted for Netflix a few years ago. They became hugely popular. At the time, I always sort of wondered if they owed a certain amount of their popularity to the fact that we were all mid-global pandemic and there weren't a huge amount of options for like new television for people to watch or new things for people to go out and do. So like everything that was coming out on TV was very zeitgeisty, was very talked about, because if there was something big, everyone was just watching it, because we didn't have that many other options, let's be realistic. But at the same time, that is also what the Bridgerton musical on TikTok benefited from, because people were on their phones, and a lot of people were at home creating who otherwise would have been outperforming. A good example of this is Carrie Hope Fletcher got involved and recorded herself singing one of the songs written for the unofficial Bridgerton musical. Would she have had time to do that if she was in a show? Probably not. We don't see her making a load of TikToks at home while she is in a run of a show because she's been busy for the rest of the year since theatres have reopened. So Bridgerton airs as a series on Netflix. It is developed by Shonda Rhimes, who is the TV mastermind behind shows like Grey's Anatomy, How to Get Away with with murder, scandal, and it is very well received. It has a very winning formula of this classic Regency romance, think Pride and Prejudice, think Sense and Sensibility, Persuasion, but it combines it with this very modern perspective, where you have this racial reconfiguration of the Regency society, where King George had married a black queen and that had forced the racial integration of society. So you end up with a much more diverse cast than you would usually see on that kind of a period drama. It was also very well known for featuring generally quite heavily sexually explicit content and being reasonably adult and things like its score being Regency style arrangements of modern pop songs. It was very cleverly done the way that Netflix brought it to life. Around the same time, TikTok had started writing fan musicals. People had been composing their own songs on TikTok to turn things into musicals, to kind of enjoy that adaptive creative process. We had seen it most famously with Ratatouille, the TikTok musical that actually ended up 
being an entire professionally filmed charity concert. So in the wake of Ratatouille, Abigail Barlow posted this TikTok to say, what if Bridgerton was a musical and performed a song that she had written based on Bridgerton? She then released another. These clips went viral. It picked up more steam. More people started getting involved. But unlike Ratatouille, the TikTok musical that had been kind of spearheaded by multiple different creators collaborating across the internet, which was part of its charm, Bridgerton, the TikTok musical, even though other people had written songs, the main thrust of its focus kind of stayed with Abigail Barlow and her songwriting partner, Emily Bear they ended up continuing just with the music that they had written and everything else that had been composed by other TikTok creators was kind of forgotten about. It just became their thing. Rather than being this fun internet collaboration, it was, we're really great at writing these songs, so we are now in charge of this. And it's worth saying as well, since the beginning, I have never been a huge TikTok person. I was charmed by both of these things happening, by Ratatouille and Bridgerton, but was always slightly wary of the weight that fans threw behind them and how eager people were to see this on a stage because they were doing this with no access to the actual intellectual property rights. They did not have any right to create a legitimate stage version of Bridgerton as a musical because Netflix obviously has the entertainment rights and the adaptive rights for stage. Fast forward to this picks up a little bit more steam and they actually record a concept album. This then goes on to win a Grammy, which was reasonably contentious at the time because it won in the category of best musical album. And the question here is, what defines a musical album if it's never actually been on stage? Because you have many shows that started life as concept albums, Jesus Christ Superstar and Avita and The Who's Tommy. Various shows have begun their life as recordings without actually having been yet performed, and this could be just another example. The only classifier here that we can really go on is something as a musical album if it calls itself a musical album, because there are plenty of non-stage recordings that have a plot, that have a sort of linear narrative running through the entire album. You have things like visual albums and Beyonce's Lemonade that arguably are more theatricalized than a collection of songs that happen to be from the perspectives of characters. And further to this, the concept of musical theatre as a music style has kind of gone out the window, especially with the success of shows like Hamilton, where musicals don't have to sound a certain way anymore because they're not going to sound consistently a certain way. And there are a lot of musicals that sound a lot more like pop albums than they do like musical theatre albums. Six is another great example of that. But regardless, Abigail Barlow and Emily Bear beat out some heavy competition to win the Grammy Award. And they were these underdogs. This was great for them. It was really nice to see them getting to travel the world and meet Andrew Lloyd Webber <coughs> and see their dreams so quickly becoming a reality. Now, prior to winning the Grammy Award, they had done a concert over here in the UK called An Evening with Barlow and Bear. I believe it played at a pop-up venue in Leicester Square. After winning the Grammy Award, it was announced that they would be performing the unofficial Bridgerton musical at the Kennedy Center in the US. And if you're not familiar with this venue, this is an enormous, very prestigious venue. And this is where Netflix have got involved. So I'm now gonna take you through this chronologically. This is what was reported on Deadline, who first broke the news of the lawsuit. The Grammy-winning team behind an unofficial Bridgerton musical is being sued by Netflix in Washington, D.C., U.S. District Court for infringement. Songwriting duo Abigail Barlow and Emily Bear were the minds behind the popular adaptation of the hit television series. They staged a live concert of the unofficial Bridgerton musical album Live in Concert at the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C. earlier this week, selling out the venue. Big deal. Bound to get Netflix's attention, which they already had but this is definitely not going to fly under the radar. Netflix originally hailed the concept when it debuted as a free online homage, but when that expanded into a profitable business, things became sticky. This is gonna get talked about a lot. The fact that Netflix had originally retweeted some of the videos of their songs and been like, this is great, this is amazing. And to a certain extent, used that to boost publicity for the show. They were aware that it was beneficial for them to have this thing happening on TikTok. And a lot of the cast of Bridgerton also reacted to this and were really excited and enthusiastic about it. Defendants Abigail Barlow and Emily Bear and their companies, Barlow and Bear, have taken valuable intellectual property from the Netflix original series Bridgerton, a huge asset for Netflix right now and one of their biggest shows, if not their biggest, to build an international brand for themselves, the lawsuit stated. 
Bridgerton reflects the creative work and hard-earned success of hundreds of artists and Netflix employees, the ones who aren't striking, I assume. Netflix owns the exclusive right to create Bridgerton songs, musicals, or any other derivative works based on Bridgerton. Barlow and Bear cannot take that right, made valuable by others' hard work for themselves without permission, yet that is exactly what they have done. And its success is definitely instrumental in the potential downfall we may be about to see here, because, and I'll probably talk about this again later, there have been plenty of parody musicals of non-owned intellectual property. I'm about to go to the Edinburgh Fringe Festival, which is a huge venue for this. I have seen Hamilton parody musicals. I've seen Disney parody musicals. I've seen Game of Thrones and Harry Potter parody musicals, all things that do not have the adaptive rights to these properties, to these works, but they are still being performed for a paid ticketed audience. And I think as well as parody law protecting these, and we are going to talk about that a little bit more, they are able to fly under the radar because they are not quite as well known as the Bridgerton musical became. I think when something is becoming that huge, it becomes very synonymous with Bridgerton's entire brand. You see a Harry Potter parody show, you know that that is not official because it's never going to get as big as original Harry Potter. But the scale and the way that the Bridgerton unofficial TikTok musical was growing was probably becoming quite intimidating for Netflix. So my initial reaction when this news emerged was that it was quite upsetting. We had all rooted for Abigail and Emily as underdogs, and it did seem as though Netflix might be this giant entity that were just sort of dunking on them and wanted to share in their success and wanted to preclude them from being able to make their own money and be creative in their own way with something that Netflix thought that it owned. I say that, it's something that Netflix does own, but we're going to get onto that a little bit more. The next thing I read that was what started to kind of change my mind a little bit here were the statements from showrunner Shonda Rhimes, Netflix themselves, and original Bridgerton author Julia Quinn. I'm going to read those for you now. So Netflix said, Netflix supports fan-generated content, but Barlow and Bear have taken this many steps further, seeking to create multiple revenue streams for themselves without formal permission to utilize the Bridgerton IP. We've tried hard to work with Barlow and Bear, more on that in the lawsuit itself, and they have refused to cooperate. The creators, cast, writers, and crew have poured their hearts and souls into Bridgerton, and we're taking action to protect their rights. Shonda Rhimes said, There is so much joy in seeing audiences fall in love with Bridgerton and watching the creative ways they express their fandom. What started as a fun celebration by Barlow and Bear on social media has turned into the blatant taking of intellectual property solely for Barlow and Bear's financial benefit. And this is very true. It is not quite as wholesome as Ratatouille the TikTok musical. No one ever benefited from that financially. When it was staged as a live streamed concert, it was for charity. And though it was with the permission of Disney, I think that was all partially due to the timings of it. We were still in the midst of COVID and it gave an opportunity for fans to watch a new musical and celebrate this Disney thing and celebrate a sense of togetherness and it gave the artists who participated in it a creative outlet that they had been missing as well because obviously all of the theatres were closed in the US and the UK. With Bridgerton it has fast become about the careers and the trajectory of Abigail and Emily and how they stand to benefit financially from what they have created. Shonda Rhimes goes on to say, just as Barlow and Bear would not allow others to appropriate their IP for profit, Netflix cannot stand by and allow Barlow and Bear to do the same with Bridgerton. Julia Quinn, the writer, also hints at this idea of being parallel creatives and appealing to their own sense of creative integrity. She says, Abigail Barlow and Emily Bear are wildly talented and I was flattered and delighted when they began composing Bridgerton songs and sharing with other fans on TikTok. There is a difference, however, between composing on TikTok and recording and performing for commercial gain. I would hope that Barlow and Bear, who share my position as independent creative professionals, understand the need to protect other professionals' intellectual property, including the characters and stories I created in the Bridgerton novels over 20 years ago. The fact that not only Netflix and Shonda, but also Julia Quinn, the writer of the books, have come out in defiance of Abigail and Emily's ongoing use of the Bridgerton IP is quite damning. That's the first thing that really made me take notice of this and think, oh gosh, this might not be about to go well for them. Because you can only go so far when the original writer of the thing that you are using says, no, please do not do this. I feel as though you are infringing on my rights as a creator.
So at this point, reactions were flying around the internet. There were still as many people, I would say, who were mad at Netflix for doing this and for not collaborating with them and not helping them to reach a Broadway stage as there were people criticizing Emily and Abigail for having done this in the first place. I decided what I needed to do at this point was to read the entire filing and all of the documents, the 25 page document that had been shared. I actually read this while I was at a wine tasting and let me tell you, the red was fantastic. So I'm not going to read this entire thing for you because it's 25 pages long, but I am going to try and pick out the key details here and some of the things that really opened my eyes to not only seeing this case from a different perspective, but seeing how intense this might be about to get. What's amusing is it is also reasonably sassy the way that they set up some of these sentences. So it starts by saying a lot of what we have already read in the Deadline article. Netflix owns the exclusive right to create Bridgerton songs, musicals, or any other derivative works based on Bridgerton. Barlow and Bear cannot take that right, made valuable by others' hard work for themselves without permission, yet that is exactly what they've done. Sassy from Netflix. It goes on to say, on July 26th, 2022, over Netflix's repeated objections, Barlow and Bear staged a massive for-profit stage show entitled the unofficial Bridgerton musical album Live in Concert to a sold out audience at the Kennedy Center with tickets ranging up to $149 each and VIP packages. The fact that it was a for-profit show and not a charity concert is going to be very important here because it meant that they benefited financially from something that they did not own. Another difference between this and the Ratatouzical. The live show featured over a dozen songs that copied verbatim dialogue, character traits and expression, and other elements from Bridgerton the series. It included dramatic portrayals of Bridgerton characters by Broadway actors, emoting through the performance of the songs that comprise the, in inverted commas, musical. I like that sentence because it's just explaining what a musical is. It was like, people sang, and also they felt things and, 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 and acted emotions. Hilarious. Throughout the performance, Barlow and Bear misrepresented to the audience that they were using Netflix's Bridgerton trademark with permission, while Netflix vigorously objected. And it shared the artwork there, the marketing material for the concert that says, Bridgerton is a trademark of Netflix used with permission. This event is not endorsed or sponsored by Netflix or its partners. How those two things can be true in conjunction is mystifying. And we will learn in this suit, according to Netflix, it is not true at all. Barlow and Bear also announced they intend to stage yet another performance of their unauthorized derivative works at the Royal Albert Hall in London, making this a world tour. Technically, I suppose. Barlow and Bear even promoted their own line of Bridgerton-themed merchandise. Barlow and Bear's conduct began on social media but stretches fan fiction well past its breaking point. It is blatant infringement of intellectual property rights. The copyright and trademark laws do not allow Barlow and Bear to appropriate others' creative work and goodwill to benefit themselves. Netflix therefore files this action to protect its rights. So before we get into the minutiae of these documents, some of the main criticisms which had been leveled against Netflix by fans included, why did Netflix not seek to work with the girls in the first place? Why did Netflix originally promote and seemingly endorse the musical on social media for their own benefit? And why was this legal action not pursued earlier, prior to the Grammy win, prior to the recording of the concept album? All of those things will be addressed. So it begins here by saying that Netflix owns registered copyrights and trademarks in the wildly popular Bridgerton series. It talks about its original creation and adaptation. There's an entire paragraph here talking about where Bridgerton is set and what its vibe is. Bridgerton speaks to a modern audience through its inclusive cast, orchestral versions of modern pop music, and a female perspective on characters' struggle against rigid societal norms and rules. That's kind of like what I said. Point three says that Bridgerton reflects the substantial creative investment of hundreds. The original author, writers, actors, directors, producers, composers, musicians, and countless others working off camera, who are clearly not important enough to list specifically here. It also reflects significant financial investments, all made over the course of many years without knowing whether Bridgerton would be a commercial and critical success. Very good point. Point four, Bridgerton was a hit. Yay for Bridgerton. By January 2021, Bridgerton had been watched by 82 million households around the world. Which goes some of the way towards explaining why Netflix are so keen to protect this very valuable asset, like we said earlier. And to respond to the demand for all things Bridgerton, Netflix created a live in-person event titled The Queen's Ball, a Bridgerton Experience, which has drawn crowds in six cities, is offering Bridgerton-themed merchandise through the Netflix online store and retail outlets, and has released the Bridgerton soundtrack on streaming platforms such as Spotify and Apple Music. Now, this is where they're going to go on to say, 
that their events are being impacted by the Bridgerton unofficial musical concert and by the merch that they are alleging that Barlow and Bear are selling there. The fact that you have two parallel Bridgerton events taking place in the US, they are going to say it's impacting ticket sales on the official Netflix event. Currently, the Queen's Ball uh, Bridgerton experience has only happened in the US, but over here in the UK, we had Secret Cinema Bridgerton, which was done in conjunction with Netflix as a sponsor, as an official involved party in it. I went to it, it was great fun, it was a lovely experience. It is not named explicitly in this lawsuit because it will not run concurrently with the performance of the unofficial British musical in the UK, so it does not make quite as strong a point about the two impacting each other's ticket sales. I've seen some people questioning online why Netflix cares about a stage adaptation and a musicalization when they are just making the TV show. Point five clears that up for us here. Netflix Worldwide Entertainment, as the copyright owner of Bridgerton, has the exclusive right to authorize derivative works based on the series. That means stage, songs, television, film, they own Bridgerton as a concept, as a copyright, and no one else is allowed to touch without their permission. Which they're not going to give because it makes them an enormous amount of money. After Bridgerton was first released in December 2020, what a time, Barlow and Bear, along with countless other fans inspired by the series, interesting that they note that it wasn't just the two of them, started posting about the series to TikTok, including creating musical compositions based on characters, scenes, dialogue, and plot points from the series. When asked directly, Netflix told Barlow and Bear time and time again that such works were not authorized. We are going to see that explained in more detail. At each step of the way, Barlow and Bear's representatives repeatedly assured Netflix that they understood Netflix's position and led Netflix to believe that Netflix would be consulted before Barlow and Bear took steps beyond streaming their album online in audio-only format. <gasps> if you want to have a great time watching this video, take a shot every time I say Netflix. Barlow and Bear's agents said that they had no interest in interfering with Netflix's right or being known only as the Bridgerton Girls, which makes sense. But with point seven, it says Barlow and Bear's representations were false to Despite their assurances to the contrary, Barlow and Bear are now claiming carte blanche authorization to profit from Netflix's protected intellectual property in whatever way they see fit. And the carte blanche there is implying that um, they are going to do what they want and they don't care. That's basically what that means. It then goes on to label the parties who are being implicated in this. It talks about the plaintiffs being Netflix Worldwide Entertainment LLC and Netflix Studios LLC. It names Abigail Barlow, as well as Pink and Purple Lady Incorporated, Emily Bear, and Barlow and Bear LLC. Point 14 states that the defendants perform together as the musical act Barlow and Bear, which really should have been point one because we've said the words Barlow and Bear 50,000 times in this legal document already. Barlow, Barlow and Bear, they are gonna get sued. So the next few points are talking about the specific infringement legal technicalities that are being invoked here. And then from the next section onwards, they go to great length to show how the work has been explicitly infringed upon, how the copyright has really been infringed. They write an awful lot just about the plot of the first two seasons that really doesn't seem to have much to do with this legal filing, but somebody had a great time recapping the whole thing. They talk about Bridgerton as an instant critical and popular phenomenon. They talk about its second season and its third season, which is scheduled to begin filming in summer 2022, and a fourth season also in development. They also say Netflix is offering the Bridgerton experience in six US cities, including in Washington DC around the time of the infringing Kennedy Center performance. Netflix offers general admission tickets for $45 and VIP tickets for $85, as well as the opportunity for private parties. I like that they're very clear to say that their Bridgerton live experience is cheaper than the Kennedy Center concert. And then we talk about what Barlow and Bear have actually done, which says Barlow and Bear began posting songs based on season one of Bridgerton on TikTok in early 2021. They were not the only fans celebrating Bridgerton. At the time, countless other fans were creating and posting Bridgerton inspired works, dressing in costume, acting out scenes and performing dances inspired by the hit series. And unfortunately for Abigail and Emily, they were very transparent with their creative process and how they turned this show into some fun musical songs, which was really great to see as fans of the musical theatre writing process. However, it is going to come back to bite them here because we go into explicit detail like below. Barlow has repeatedly said that she based the songs on dialogue from Bridgerton. Not good. 
For instance, Barlow said she wanted to turn Bridgerton into a musical. The opening scene is so theatrical. I could just see each part of the stage lighting up in my brain. And then I kept writing down lines of dialogue that sounded like song titles. Yikes. The fact that not only they have said very openly, this is a musical based on Bridgerton, but that they have said, look, we are using all of these lines from the book, from the TV show. We are turning them into songs. That is not going to help them here, needless to say. Likewise, Barlow explained, there are just so many pieces of dialogue in this show that write songs themselves. I just kept picking all of these little moments that are so iconically written in the show. In particular, Barlow has credited the Bridgerton line, you have no idea what it's like to be in a Oh, sorry, hold on. I should do a character version of this. Who says this? Is this the Duke of Hastings? I can't do a Duke of Hastings. I'm not convincing enough. Maybe Daphne says this. You have no idea what it's like to be in a room with someone you can't live without and feel like they're oceans away from you. As inspiration. Barlow and Bear created the musical by watching certain scenes from Bridgerton on repeat. For instance, Bear explained that when we were writing the opening number, we watched that opening scene so many times because it's theatrical. It is then written, rather than restate every infringing lyric that copies verbatim dialogue, each scene or plot element that is lifted or every character that is reproduced by Barlow and Bear, Netflix sets forth below representative examples of infringement with dozens more listed in exhibit D to this complaint. This is basically Netflix's lawyers being sassy and being like, They've infringed on just so much of our copyrighted content that we can't begin to list it all, but here are some examples. They talk about the comparison between dialogue in the very first musical track of the concept album, Tis the Season. They talk about very similar language between Eloise's lines in the TV show with the song If I Were a Man. And then they talk about Ocean Away and the same kind of parallels that they are seeing there. I mean, none of this is really necessary. They are just really laboring and hammering the point there that their copyright has been heavily infringed because they've been quite open, Barlow and Bear, in saying the entire time, this is based on Bridgerton, the TV series, the adaptation of the book. There is no gray area here for them to say, oh, well, it's inspired by with similar characters. No, they have been very explicitly clear throughout. A parallel example to this would be how Fifty Shades of Grey started its life as a fan fiction of Twilight, obviously changed the names of characters and the setting so that the two no longer resemble each other, and that is definitely not something that Emily and Abigail have done. But maybe they should have. Barlow and Bears, the unofficial Bridgerton musical is not authorized by Netflix, Shondaland, or Julia Quinn, and Netflix has never given Barlow and Bear permission to create or perform the unofficial Bridgerton musical live, let alone at the Kennedy Center or Royal Albert Hall. And that is really the key cornerstone of this case, in that Netflix had said, you are not entitled to give live performances of this work as an entirety. Barlow and Bear, like I've just been saying, have admitted this publicly. They don't own the IP. Yet in attempting to defend their client's blatant infringement, Barlow and Bear's attorneys have now taken the position that they somehow do not need a license because Netflix did not file this lawsuit sooner. That is not how copyright law works. So remember I said some people were saying, why did Netflix not sue sooner? Unfortunately, it's Netflix's prerogative to sue whenever they like. They do not have to bring legal action against everyone they think may be infringing on their copyright. And on the one hand, and you could think that this is very jaded and you could say Netflix were just waiting until they had made money that they could come after and success that they could try and poach. On the other hand, it would also not be a great look for Netflix to go after every minimal infringement on their copyright rights for everyone who took fan fiction slightly too far on social media, who maybe in the wake of this case may be a little more careful about that in future. But in any case, it is not a mark against them that they have waited this long to bring this legal action against Emily and Abigail. It says, Netflix is not required to sue every infringer. Rather, it can make its rights known, which it unambiguously and repeatedly did here. Interestingly, while I was at university and involved in a musical theatre society, there was another society at the same uni that had been planning to adapt a series of unfortunate events as a stage production. And... And as far as I am aware, they were actually contacted by Netflix and sent a cease and desist because Netflix were in the process of adapting it for a television series. So you can't just turn anything into a stage show and charge money for tickets without getting the permission if you do not have rights to the property. And even very, very small societies in random towns in England will hear from Netflix potentially if they try and do that. So though Netflix may not always pursue this legal action, it stands to reason they are probably always watching. So it then says, here is the history, and this is gonna walk us through everything so far. 
It is no secret that in early 2021, Netflix did not stop what Barlow and Bear represented as their personal TikTok fan tribute to Bridgerton. Numerous individuals involved in the creation of Bridgerton, including actors, producers, and Netflix, applauded Barlow and Bear, including with the tweet, absolutely blown away by the Bridgerton musical playing out on TikTok. Barlow and Bear benefited from the attention. They went viral. Now, I do want to clarify here. The wording of that makes it sound like it was Netflix's acknowledgement of them and retweeting of them that made them go viral. They had very much gone viral prior to this. This is how Netflix found out about them in the first place. So that, I will say, is a falsehood. In March 2021, Barlow and Bear's counsel asked expressly for Netflix's blessing of a recorded album and a single specific UK charity promotion to occur in or around July or August of 2021, for which they would engage West End performers who had been furloughed because of the pandemic, which is very nice. Netflix responded in June that it was not approving or authorizing the album's release or any charity performances, but in the spirit of supporting what Barlow and Bear represented as two Bridgerton fans' expression of their appreciation for the series, it stated that it was not standing in the way. Barlow and Bear did not ask for, and Netflix never granted, ongoing authorization or any license. Ultimately, the requested performances did not happen. So there was going to be a charity concert version in the UK. They had asked Netflix if they had permission for this, and Netflix was like, no, not expressly, but we are not going to stop you just on the basis of goodwill. And the fact that this was for charity and not ticketed probably had something to do with that as well. They were not benefiting financially. They were just performing for free and to aid West End performers who had been out of work, something that they had written based on something that they loved, which is a very different concept to what actually ended up happening at the Kennedy Center. In August, after learning that Barlow and Bear were due to release an album to Spotify the following month, Netflix sought to advise them of a clear line. Netflix representatives stressed to Barlow and Bear's representative that Netflix would not authorize and did not want them to engage in any live performances, e.g. performances of the unofficial Bridgerton musical or other derivative works that might compete with Netflix's own planned live events, the Bridgerton Experience. At the time, Barlow and Bear's representatives stated no such events or other works based on the unofficial Bridgerton musical were planned. Barlow and Bear's representative also made clear that they wanted to focus on their other work to avoid becoming known as the Bridgerton Girls, which super feels like what they ought to have done. It gained them a lot of attention as songwriters, as talents. Abigail specifically is this phenomenal talent. She's an amazing dancer, an amazing singer. Emily obviously is this incredibly gifted musical mind. What it feels like they ought to have done here is use this platform to then write their own original musical and launch that. In November 2021, Barlow and Bear's representative informed Netflix that their cancelled UK charity performance had been rescheduled for later that month, and that proceeds from the event would be donated to a local foundation. Barlow and Bear's representative stated that they planned to do this live concert focused on Barlow and Bear's broader repertoire, i.e. not as the unofficial Bridgerton musical, and that it would include only a few of the songs. Netflix again reiterated that live performances were not authorized and that the UK event should only be a one-time occurrence. Barlow and Bear's representative confirmed that they fully understood. Given Netflix's clear statement to Barlow and Bear that this would be the last such event, Barlow and Bear's assurances that it would be, and their express statement that they plan to focus on other projects to avoid becoming known as the Bridgerton Girls, Netflix did not seek to halt the rescheduled charity event in the UK. And this was a safer move from Barlow and Bear. Netflix clearly are not still particularly thrilled about it, and they did not want this material to be performed live, especially for a paying audience. The fact that it was for charity, the fact that this was a one-time only deal, Netflix had made peace with that. And what Emily and Abigail were doing here was performing as Barlow and Bear. It was an evening with Barlow and Bear rather than selling it with the event being called the unofficial Bridgerton musical. Netflix did not want that. They did not want it billed as a Bridgerton event. It was an evening with the songwriters who are best known for this Bridgerton thing on TikTok. And that, again, feels like it's how they should have proceeded. Even when they got to the Kennedy Center, even on the back of the Grammy win, they definitely should have gone forwards as Barlow and Bear, who you may know from the Bridgerton musical. However, that doesn't sell nearly enough tickets. Because even people who are aware of their success, who have seen them win the Grammy, who have seen them on talk shows with Kelly Clarkson, who have seen them on TikTok originally, may not readily associate that with an evening with Barlow and Bear, the same way they will with 
the unofficial Bridgerton musical. If you are selling tickets, if you're a promoter, a producer of this event, you want that to be the title because that is what is going to help you sell tickets to these very big venues. It's worth saying this has been a huge jump in the size of venue that they have been taking their work to. When they did this original concert in the UK, it was a much smaller venue. The Kennedy Center and the Royal Albert Hall are huge. In March 2022, following Barlow and Bear's Grammy nomination, Netflix reached out again to reiterate the lines. Again, representatives of Barlow and Bear reiterated that they would be focusing on other activities in the future. And it kind of goes on in this way. We see here Netflix outlining how many times they made it expressly and explicitly clear to these girls what they were allowed to do with the Bridgerton IP and what the restrictions on that were. They are very clear, no further live performances, and from the sounds of it, if Netflix are to be believed here in this official court filing, the representatives of Barlow and Bear said, yep, we're not planning to do that, that's absolutely fine. So what happened? Despite their prior assurances, on June 7th, 2022, Barlow and Bear's representative informed Netflix for the first time that they would be performing the unofficial Bridgerton musical at the Kennedy Center on July 26th. Netflix then sought to understand from Barlow and Bear's representative what type of performance was planned, how it would be marketed, and whether it would be for charity. Rather than engaging with Netflix on its questions, Barlow and Bear's representative stated that they were not asking for Netflix's permission and would not further delay the announcement of the performance to afford the parties time to discuss. They publicly announced the Kennedy Center show within days. So just outwardly not cooperating with Netflix as the holder of the intellectual property there and just doing their own thing. It is clear at this point they have decided that they are able to operate without the permission of Netflix as the rights holder, which legally, no, is the answer. Multiple times, in June and July 2022, Netflix informed counsel for Barlow and Bear that the July 26th performance and any subsequent live performances were not authorized and that such exploitation would constitute a willful copyright and trademark infringement unless they negotiated a license, which Netflix was willing to do. Here is where it gets very interesting. Netflix offered Barlow and Bear a license that would allow them to proceed with their scheduled live performances at the Kennedy Center and Royal Albert Hall, continue distributing their album, and perform their Bridgerton-inspired songs live as part of larger programs going forward. Barlow and Bear refused. So as I said earlier, a lot of fans have been very critical of Netflix online, saying why did they not work with the girls from the beginning? It is clear at this point that they made an attempt to. They offered them a license to perform the work, and this was the only legal way that they would be able to perform the work. However, it does not state the terms of the license. Whether this is something that's going to emerge during the ongoing legal proceedings, I would be very interested to know what the terms of this license were, because it is implied by the fact that they rejected it, that they were not great financial terms. Netflix may have wanted to take a very sizable cut of the profits being generated from this work. However, for Barlow and Bear, this probably still would have been for the best. They could continue to further their own brand and promote themselves rather than being the girls that illegally tried to make a musical. I mean, there's still publicity in that, but it is a very different kind of publicity. It does come across slightly money-hungry that they were unwilling to cooperate with Netflix on this, at least from what I am reading here. We have not yet heard from Abigail and Emily or their representatives on this. Barlow and Bear then doubled down on their infringement and resulting harm to Netflix. Netflix found out from the press that the performance would include Broadway actors. Not clear why that adds insult to injury, but they're very explicit about it here. It also talks about how they marketed the show on social media by saying, come show up at the Kennedy Center, it's going to be a ball, drawing on the same market for the Bridgerton experience without authorization. It's not literally going to be a ball, so I do think that line is kind of reaching. It is not branding it as it is literally going to be a ball, it is a play on words. But like I said, this is a very sassy filing from Netflix. It then talks about the Kennedy Center performance, which went forward, which sold tickets, Broadway performers performed. It talks about the explicit comparisons between those performances and the TV show. This is also interesting. The Kennedy Center performance materials, including the performance program book, posters displayed at the venue, and the onstage performance backdrop were all prominently branded with the Bridgerton mark. All of the materials also wrongly assured audience members that the mark was being used with permission, even though Netflix had made clear to Barlow and Bear they had no such permission. That feels just wildly foolish for it to actually allege that it has the permission of Netflix when Netflix allegedly have made it 
very clear to them that that was not the case. There seems to be no feasible way in which they could have misunderstood this unless somebody relayed deliberately, willfully false information to the marketing department. And I do want to expand on that because the Kennedy Center is a very prestigious venue. And from what I have heard, the producers of this concert are not neophytes. They know what they are doing as well. They are established professionals within the industry. None of these people or producers or organizations would have got involved with this if they believed there was any kind of a legal risk attached to it, at least not as far as I believe. So the question then becomes, was everyone involved with this concert, from its producers to its press to its marketing team, aware that it was being done illegally and contravening copyright law, or were they misled by someone at the top? Was it a representative? Was it a producer? Was it Abigail and Emily themselves? Who was claiming here, if somebody indeed was, that they had Netflix's permission when, according to Netflix, they did not? I don't know the answer to this. We may find out in time. Here is another point. Barlow and Bear's Kennedy Center performance interfered with Netflix's long announced offering of the Bridgerton Experience in Washington, DC. It attracted Bridgerton fans who would have otherwise attended the Bridgerton Experience and created confusion as to whether Netflix had approved of Barlow and Bear's unauthorized derivative works. And this is where it becomes a conversation not only about copyright, but potentially about loss of income as well. Netflix are mad that people have gone to the musical concert rather than going to the Queen's Ball Bridgerton Live Experience event. The fact that they were on concurrently in the same city really does not help here. Because if that was not the case, it would be much harder for them to make any kind of an allegation against the girls that they damaged Netflix's revenue and sales of any kind of Bridgerton event. Barlow and Bear's decision to usurp the Bridgerton series and brand for itself threatens Netflix and everyone engaged in the Bridgerton franchise with irreparable harm. Does it? I don't know about that one. It then goes on to talk about the planned show at the Royal Albert Hall, and it says this threatens Netflix's plans for the Bridgerton experience in the United Kingdom. Now, we've already had Secret Cinema Bridgerton, which seems very similar to this Bridgerton Ball experience, but this would suggest that Netflix at least plans to roll out the same kind of event over here as well. Barlow and Bear have also stated that they are planning further live performances of the unofficial Bridgerton musical. Indeed, the description to the newly released songbook states that Barlow and Bear are performing at concerts and music events around the world. Netflix have really taken their time to study up everything that is being released, everything that is being said about this musical before they filed this. And this may be some kind of an insight as to why Netflix have taken their time to bring this legal action and it was not before the Kennedy Center performance. Netflix have very much got all of their ducks in a very tight row before bringing this case against Abigail and Emily. It just so happens that they have also brought it against them when they have concert revenue to go after. There are then a lot of further points, and I was desperately scanning through this, trying to gauge some kind of an impression as to what they will seek in damages. I am not enough of a legal mind to infer that from this. I did find uh, some codes that I then subsequently read up on, and something indicated that it would not be in excess of $150,000. Whether that is accurate, whether they will ask for more, whether the potential loss of income that they can claim from the DC Bridgerton experience will impact that, I do not know. If anyone watching this video is a legal professional and has any kind of insight into how much they may seek in damages, please let me know down in the comment section. I would be very intrigued to gain some insight into what we can expect on that front. And just generally about the entire case, if you have any other kind of legal insight, let us know. Share your thoughts with us down in the comments. There is one point in the filing that also says the defendant's conduct is willful. They've made it very clear that Abigail and Emily were aware of what they were doing. They knew they were contravening copyright law when this was done. And people have talked about parody law online, and I want to expand on this a little bit more because you do have some parody musicals. There is a Titanic parody currently taking place in New York. There are various parody shows that happen at the Edinburgh Fringe. It is very difficult to call this parody because there is no sense of kind of spoofing or really editing anything about Bridgerton as a concept for this. It is just a legitimate and heartfelt and sincere adaptation. So if they do seek any kind of protection under parody law, that is going to be difficult for them to claim. And that may be why the filing has been so extensive about talking about 
the similarities in tone, in delivery, and in literal lines from the TV series. Now, we haven't heard any kind of a statement yet from Abigail Barlow and Emily Bear or their representatives. We do know that they are represented by some very big players in the industry, in the US, which makes this all the more surprising that it was allowed to get to this point. People who absolutely should have known better, whether they have been misled by the artists themselves, I do not know. I'm not making any kind of allegation here, but it's difficult to understand why such towering professionals would allow themselves and allow their clients to get into this kind of a situation. This is something people were very aware of from the beginning, that they did not have access to this intellectual property, and certainly the organization around the Kennedy Center concert just seems ridiculous. The fact that it had been made so clear to them so many times, allegedly, by Netflix, that this was not going to be permitted, and then it happened regardless, not only against Netflix's wishes because they no longer felt they needed Netflix's permission for some reason, seemingly because they were emboldened by the Grammy win, and then not only that, they used marketing materials to suggest that they had Netflix's permission when they didn't and simply lied about it. I will say it seems as though they were emboldened by this Grammy win and they felt like that kind of protected them enough that it had legitimized them as their own thing and people thought of them as big as the Bridgerton TV series, even though they did not have the rights and Netflix did. And had they just kept performing as themselves as songwriters, they may not have run into this difficulty, but it felt like they needed to use the unofficial Bridgerton musical as a selling point to catapult themselves to these larger venues. Do I think there's a little bit of greed in that? Sure, I think. They were riding high on this enormous success, winning the Grammy over a lot of other big musicals, and they wanted to go straight to these big venues and become these really big fish in the musical theatre world. They may now be about to get plucked out of the water by Netflix. What I'm really hoping for is that this doesn't play out on social media. We have seen enough controversial trial commentary recently with the Johnny Depp and Amber Heard case happening on TikTok. I think it's just messy and unhelpful and not beneficial to anyone involved for this to play out on social media. I don't know whether a settlement might be reached prior to any kind of a trial. It is clear that Netflix will seek to prevent them being able to perform this material in the future, which is definitely not something that they are going to want to agree to. And if they didn't reach a license before, they're only going to be in a worse position for negotiating one now. So let me know your thoughts on all of this in the comments section down below. Has it changed your mind about who is really in the wrong here and whether Netflix were right to bring this legal action against these composers? Let me know your thoughts. I'm very intrigued to see what other people think. And thank you so much for watching today's video. I hope this straightened out some of the muddling facts for you, and I hope you enjoyed. If you did, make sure to subscribe to my channel for plenty more stagey content coming very soon. Also, if you enjoyed, feel free to give me a super thanks down below because this has been exhausting and has taken hours of my life. You can also support me as a content creator by heading to patreon.com forward slash Theatre, where you can gain access to some exclusive photo and video content. I hope that everyone is staying safe and that you have a stagey day. For ten more seconds, I'm Mickey Joe Theatre. Oh my god, hey. Thanks for watching, have a stagey day. Subscribe! <laughs>